Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Redeemer Lutheran Church Bible study on the book of Acts. I'm Pastor Eric Kleinschmidt, back from vacation, ready to go through Acts chapter 2 with you, one of the most um, widely read and best known chapters in the book of Acts, primarily because it's almost always read at the occasion of Pentecost. So, um, if you missed the first installments, there was an introduction and then chapter one uh, about three weeks ago before I went on vacation. I will put that link up above here so you can backtrack and start off from the beginning. Today we're going to talk about apostolic gifts, namely the speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about the Jewish feasts and what they mean, and we're going to talk about the primary purpose of the book of Acts, and that is that Jesus is actually meant for everyone. I know that we take that for granted, but you have to go back to the first century as a, a Jew and imagine what an earth-shattering change that was to understand that Jesus opens up all the promises of God to everybody. And that was met with some consternation, and that's one of the reasons why we have all the epistles in the New Testament, is because the church is primarily composed of Jewish converts, and then also pagan converts came together, and they were like, well, are we all equal? Are we all the same footing? What's going on here? Can we have pork spare ribs at our church potluck or not? That sort of thing. And much of the New Testament is written from the apostles clarifying and explaining that Jesus is indeed meant for the Gentiles as much as he is meant for the Jews. We'll get into that, all right? So first, Acts chapter 2. Again, we're following the English Standard Version, the translation that we use primarily in church here at Redeemer, but please feel free to use whatever translation you have available or just follow along on the screen. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That is, the 11 disciples. Now they have added Matthias, so they are back to 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, which represent all of God's people. So that number 12 is representative of all of God's people. The 12 apostles, teachers of the church, are now all together. Where are they all together? We're not exactly sure. They are in a large space or room, okay? Um, where they can accommodate uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people in and around that area. So it's um, it might be a room with people surrounding outside. It might be a, a largish meeting hall, although we've never really, as far as I'm aware, uncovered like large meeting halls. It could also be um, a teaching portion of the temple. That's possible as well. We don't know exactly where they were, but we know that we are they are all together. The day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a Jewish festival, also known as the Feast of Weeks. It occurs 50 days after Passover and celebrates the wheat harvest for God's people. It was one of the principal feasts of Judaism in which all able-bodied male Jews were required, if at all possible, to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the temple, and offer a gift of their first fruits in thanksgiving for God giving them grain, basically. And so you have gathered in Jerusalem a whole bunch of people from all over the, the world because Judaism had spread beyond just Hebrew people. There, They also had the dispersion. You have people going out, but you also have people that were sojourners, were, who were um, servants, who were converts, um, who would like to be a part of it, even if they didn't have the direct bloodline. So we have a great mix of people in Jerusalem for this festival, this Pentecost, 50 days after Passover or the Feast of Weeks. They're all gathered there to celebrate the harvest and give thanks to God, which makes it a perfect occasion for the Holy Spirit to come and harvest the people. Okay, they will see that theme throughout the New Testament. Uh, Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He's not talking about grain. He's talking about people, okay? So when the day of Pentecost arrived, the apostles were all in one place, wherever that was. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, does that mean that there was wind? Not exactly. It says there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, okay? Uh, 
All right, so where were they? They're in a house. What does that mean? Don't know. How big? Where? We don't know those sorts of things. And divided tongues as of fire. So like fire. So were there actually flames on top of their head? Uh, probably not. But maybe. That's the... See, wherever you're dealing with literature, the apocalyptic literature and vision literature and miraculous literature in the scriptures, you have to kind of discern, is this literal or is this figurative? How do you do context? So you got to read very carefully. It does not say there came from heaven a mighty rushing wind. That's not what it says. It says a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It does not say divided tongues of fire appeared over their heads. It says divided tongues as of fire appeared on to them and rested on each one of them. What I see here is that um, Luke, who's writing and who has listened to people describe this, has probably interviewed people and had them say, man, I don't know how to describe it other than it sounded like a great rushing wind. It's kind of like when people talk about the tornado sounded like a freight train. Oh, so you mean the tornadoes go chugga, 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 choo, choo. Like, that's, that's what tornadoes do? Well, well, no, I think it means the rumbling that comes and it gets louder and louder. And um, so how we discern that, um, you, you have to interpret it. You have to do that through context. Now, is it possible that it, there really was a wind and that there really was flames of fire above their heads? Sure, that's possible. But a careful reading of the text gives us a, an inclination that whatever it was, it, the people who saw it, witnessed it, were struggling to describe it. John does the same thing in the book of Revelation when he talks about his visions of heaven. He is trying to take something that is otherworldly and bring it down to human language. And he finds that human language isn't descriptive enough. We don't have anything like it. So he has to kind of compare it. And that's why we get these weird comparisons. Okay. So I think that's what's happening here. Um, so the other things that are going on here is the sound of a rushing wind and fire are usually indications of God's presence, okay? So you'll see that throughout the Old Testament. Um, how did God appear to Moses? Well, it was in a burning bush, right? Um, God appears, and when he's doing something, these are often the more tangible um, perceptive things that people pick up on, wind and uh, the crushing of rocks and earthquakes and, and fire. These are all things that seem to attend God's presence among the people here on earth. And so somebody who is familiar with the Old Testament, who's going to be reading about this, a, a rushing wind and fire is immediately going to think back to all the times in the Old Testament when God interacted with his people that way, okay? So what we're being told here is the disciples are all in one place and God came and visited them. All right. That's what we can say for sure. Verse four, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues, that is other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this was a gift from God, a supernatural gift that they would speak in languages that they had not studied, or at least had not studied so that they were fluent. Or it may be that they were speaking their own language, but they are being heard in multiple other ones. Again, that's a difficult thing to discern. And does it really matter in the end? Well, I don't think so. But it's interesting as we study these things to kind of parse those out. Did they actually speak in uh, Cretan? Or were they speaking in Galilean and the, the people from Crete just heard Cretan? I don't know, okay? We, uh, it's kind of interesting to think about that, but we're told here that whatever God did, he uh, gave them a gift in which people who did not speak their language heard them and understood what they were saying. So we have to just sort of stop there and, and say the Bible doesn't reveal much more than that, okay? But they are speaking God's word to a multitude of people that are hearing the same, same message, okay? And that's what we get here in verse five. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, and who are they? Devout men from every nation under heaven who had all gathered for the Feast of Weeks and Tabernacles, okay? Uh, feast of Weeks is for the grain harvest, Feast of Tabernacles is more for the, the, the uh, grape harvest. 
but but they're they're so close together. Okay, so it's just all kind of they they're all gathered for these festivals in Jerusalem. At this sound, that is at the the sound of the rushing wind and probably the 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 multiple languages or whatever they're hearing, um, the multitude that is the people around them came together, and they were all bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Okay. So that's what we, we, whatever they're, they were saying, the people heard it in their own language. That's what we know. Okay. Now you can imagine that when people from different, different places who probably maybe all spoke Hebrew, at least somewhat because they were all Jews and learned it, but in their day-to-day -day life, that's not what they're speaking because they're living in Crete. Okay. Or they're living in, in Phrygia. All right. And when they come back to Jerusalem, yeah, they can interact with other Jews and speak Hebrew, but they're not really all that fluent in that language to do their day-to-day -day business. And so they're kind of like uh, Americans on a tour bus in Italy, all right? Maybe they've taken a few uh, Babel or Babel classes on Italian to ask where the restroom was and order the fettuccine Alfredo, I don't know but they're much more comfortable hanging out on the tour bus talking to all the tourists that speak English, right? You can imagine the same thing. The people from Phrygia, even though they're in Jerusalem and can all speak Hebrew, are probably, you know, gathered around other people from Phrygia. People from Pontus, same thing. People from Crete, the same thing. But then they hear this and they all come together and they're saying like, well, wait a minute, you, you, you get this too? And Maybe they're, they're trying to converse with each other in, in Hebrew and try to say, what's, what's he saying to you? What are you hearing? Like, you hear him speaking in your language, but he, I hear him speaking in mine. Like, how, how is this possible? It's just an amazing thing. So what happened is people who were together as Jews, who had been dispersed and divided, Tower of Babel, right? And could no longer be united because of their language are now being reunited in a miraculous language event that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So God is gathering his people together under one message that is being proclaimed. We'll get there, okay? They were all bewildered, that makes sense, and they were all amazed and astonished. And they said, are not all these guys speaking Galileans, right? They didn't study my language. How do they know this? How do they know my dialect? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, people who were um, uh, becoming Jews, who were converting, okay? Uh, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying, what does this mean? That's the great Lutheran question. What does this mean? Right? Um, but others, even in this miraculous event, mocked them. And what they say? They're filled with new wine. Oh, they've been drinking too much already. Because remember, part of the, the feast was a Thanksgiving for the grape harvest. And the Thanksgiving of the grape harvest came with the minting of new wine. Okay? So that's what they're saying. It's like, oh, yeah, they've already been tapping into the new wine reserve. They're just drunk and babbling on. All right. So even in this miraculous event, there are detractors. Uh -huh. Now, here's another thing that I find remarkably interesting. This Pentecost festival encompasses Thanksgiving for two food elements, bread and wine. Coincidence? No, <laughs> not a coincidence. And I don't think that was lost on the apostles. Well, Jesus just uh, converted the, the Passover celebration into the Eucharist, the, the Holy Communion, where he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And he used bread and wine for it. And now we have the big celebration of bread and wine, and, and God is gathering his people, not just from uh, around his table, but from the ends of the earth. I don't think that was lost on the, the apostles. They're smarter than we often give them credit for. Uh, but what we see here is God gathering the people. And this really is uh, the remember point that I wanted to have for, for our, our study here. Uh, things to remember. Number two, that Jesus is for Gentiles too. We take that for granted. But you have to remember, Old Testament, God picks out from among all the nations of the world Abraham's descendants. He makes them a promise. He fulfills that promise through generations reiterates that promise, okay? 
And so when the Messiah comes, the natural thing for those who believed in him, which was very few of them at the beginning, was to assume that he was meant for Jews only. After all, everything before this was meant for us. And what we see then here is that God is going to gather in his people from everywhere. And then with Paul, when he starts preaching Christ to Gentiles and gets hauled into the church in Jerusalem, and it said, what are you doing? And he says, this is what Jesus told me to do, and this is what I'm proclaiming. We see this miraculous thing where the apostles go, well, then Jesus is meant for the Gentiles too. They realize that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and that world is greater than just Jews. That's an incredible expansion, and what we see then is that the Old Testament wasn't meant just for God's chosen people, but for all of the people. And you say, well, isn't that a little bit unfair to the, to the Jews? Okay, well, let's back up. In the Old Testament, you have Abraham's descendants, okay? We have Hebrew people, Jewish people. We want to call them Jews at this point. Fine, okay? And then you have the pagans, you have the Canaanites. Why aren't they the same, okay? Are they related? Yes, they are. The Canaanites, the pagan religions, if they trace their ancestors back and you trace Abraham's ancestors back, guess what? You go to the same place. We're all from Adam and Eve. Therefore, we were all heirs to the promise given to Eve and given to Adam, by extension, in Genesis 3, that the Messiah would come and crush the head of the serpent. Okay? That is the first proclamation of Jesus. And it's in Genesis 3.15, given to all people through Adam and Eve. All right? Now, what happens is their children, some of them continue to believe, and some of them fall into unbelief. Some of them create idols. Some of them worship their ancestors. All of that, they've fallen away. So that when you come into the promised land, the people who were faithful to the God of Adam and Eve, okay, are told they will inherit the land, whereas all the ones who had rejected the promise that was given to their ancestors, Adam and Eve, will be destroyed and driven out. It's a picture of divine judgment, Armageddon, that we have at the very end, where either you're with Jesus and are saved, or you're without him and will be damned. That's what's being depicted in the cleansing of the promised land, okay? God still loves those people, those Gentiles, those non-descendants of Abraham, because they still go back to the promise given to Eve, all right? So when we understand that way, it should be no surprise that Jesus throws the doors of salvation open, not just to Jews, but to all the people, all the descendants of Adam and Eve, because he told them that's exactly what he would do back in Genesis 3.15. So the Jews have a rightful understanding of saying, but we thought Jesus was just for us. The apostles and then later Paul, who is a Jew, are saying, guys, I know that's what we expected, but it's better than that. It's bigger than that. Jesus died for everyone, right? And we shouldn't be upset about that. We really shouldn't. So that's what we see happening here. And it's a big thing. Um, not so much to us because we're on the tail end of it, but if we were living to that time, it would be monumental change. And we're going to see that in real time as we go through the book of Acts. But I want you to remember as we go along Jesus is meant for Gentiles too. That's one of the major themes and the major teachings and revelations that we find in the book of Acts. All right, let's go back to the text. Uh, bread and wine, communion. Yep, we're all united around the Lord's table still. Yep, wonderful. So now Peter's going to take this opportunity and he's going to talk to them. So let's see what he has to say. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people, my fellow brothers in the ministry here, are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. We wouldn't even have time to get into the wine this bad. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And here he's quoting Joel chapter 2. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Okay, prophesy can be used two ways. One is to foretell events, saying that tomorrow at 3 p.m. a purple hippopotamus will walk down Main Street, and then that happens, okay? What a prophecy, okay? 
The other is to forth tell, to speak forth things that you already know. So in that way, the prophets went and said, you're all sinners, but God will save you if you repent. That was not some revelation that they, the people hadn't heard before. God had said that before. Okay, pastors on Sunday, they forth tell. They tell you things that you already know. You're sinners, Jesus loves you, Jesus died for you. That's, you all know that. It's the same sermon every week because it's the same message, but we continue to tell it because it's, we're speaking God's word. That's what a prophet does. It's not just reviewing, um, revealing future events. It's also just speaking the truth from God. So your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Does that mean that they're all going to predict the future? No, but they shall speak God's word, the mighty works of God. And that's exactly what happened at Pentecost. And Peter is the one who says, this is what Joel told us, man. We, we should have, right? We recognize this. Your old men shall dream dreams. Um, dream dreams. So does God communicate through dreams? A uh, little sidebar. Did God communicate through dreams in the Bible? Yes, he did. He did it even to Joseph. Um, and that's why he did not fear to take Mary as his wife. Does God communicate through dreams today? <sighs> I would say probably not. And the main reason I do that is because in the Bible it says that both tongues and dreams and prophecies, they will cease. It says that in 1 Corinthians 13. As for prophecies, they will pass away. Let me get here. As for prophecies, they will pass away. For tongues, they will cease. Okay? So I, I don't believe that today we should expect God to communicate through a, to us in dreams because we have the Bible. God has revealed that. Did God use dreams at certain points, at certain times? Yes. Did people have any question about what happened? No, they did not. They knew where the dream came from. So if you have a weird dream, you wake up and I say, wonder if God is speaking to me? No, he's not. Because you wouldn't be wondering. You wouldn't have that question. All right? And if you did, you'd have a, a prophet that would show up the next day and say, hey, my name is Samuel. I heard you had a crazy dream. Let me talk to you. You know, um, let me tell you what it means. You know, hi, I'm Daniel. Let me tell you about this crazy statue dream you had. And you're like, what? How did you know I had a statue dream? And those, it does happen, but we should not expect it to happen anymore. Again, in the book of Acts, things are descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive. They describe what happened. They don't necessarily tell us what will continue to happen. Keep remembering that, all right? Even on my male servants and female servants, okay? Now, this isn't about being a pastor. This is about speaking God's word. Women can speak God's word, and thank God they do, particularly in their families and to their children, okay? So this is not talking about the pastoral office. It's a different topic. We can get into that some other time. This is simply saying that God's people will speak his word, and things will happen. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. They will speak my word. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Is that literal? Uh, I don't know. Um, I hope not, but maybe it will be. Um, again, you're dealing with revelatory literature. It's difficult to, to understand if God really does mean that the moon will turn to blood, or will it be like what we saw recently with the wildfires? Um, I have a telescope. I aimed it at the moon, and it was hazy, and it was red because of all the, the ash in, in the air. So what is literal, what is figurative in revelatory and apocalyptic literature? That's difficult to suss out. You have to do your best with context, and also use places where you're not in revelatory or apocalyptic literature in the Bible to understand it. Um, Jesus once said, I am the door of the sheep. And you say, well, does he, does he mean that he's a literal door? Well, if you go into the context of that paragraph, he says later that the people didn't get this figure of speech. So he told them plainly. So right there, we're told in the context that Jesus isn't saying, I'm a literal door. He's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, getcha? All right, so it's difficult, but it's not the easiest thing, but that's what we're dealing with here. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And look, and it shall come to pass that everyone, everyone, not just Jews, who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the important part of this. And that's Peter's point to this sermon. He's saying, in Jesus, we have the fulfillment of everything we were looking forward to and everything we were worried about in judgment. And even though terrible things are happening and will continue to happen, 
we know that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how do we call upon the Lord and be saved? It is through the one God has sent, Jesus. Now, let me tell you about Jesus is what Peter's saying here. He's got, he's in the, look at this sermon. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, this is how we call on the, the name of the Lord. A man attested to you by God, that is God the Father, with mighty works and wonders, just as all of this, right, show wonders in the heavens above. Jesus did those wonders, signs. He did them in your midst, as you yourselves know. Peter's saying, you saw these things just like we did. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And then look at this. You crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men. You did this. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Death could not hold him. He raised from the dead, and we saw that. All right? So Peter says, you guys didn't recognize the Messiah when he came, and instead you crucified him. This is not how you make nice with people, and Peter's not interested. He's interested in getting to the heart of the matter of telling them, God told us this would happen. It happened in our sight. Most of you missed it. Now you have an opportunity to come back and be a part of it. That's what Peter is saying. He's going to tell them something else they're familiar with. He's going to go back to the Psalms. Uh, I think it's Psalm 110. No, Psalm 16 um, is where this is quoted from. David says concerning him in Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me. So David here is talking about, I saw God and he is... He is right by my side that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Now David's going to shift. And this is confusing language. But we have to understand that David, with the help of the Holy Spirit, is speaking as and on behalf of his descendant. He, in the Spirit, looks forward and sees Jesus as his descendant, the Messiah, because that's what God promised. And now, with the help of the Holy Spirit, David is going to foretell something that will happen to his descendant as if it were happening to him. So he goes in the first person, but he's speaking as Jesus here, if you understand it that way. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, that is the underworld, to death, not necessarily hell, but just to death is how Jews understood that. Or let your Holy One. Now, David wasn't the Holy One. The Holy One was the Christ that was prophesied. And here it is, let your Holy One. It's in, in the first verse, see corruption. So that the body won't decay, right? All right. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. All right. Now, Peter's going to explain this, and he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. He is seeing corruption, and he is in Hades. He's in the underworld. He's not in hell. He's just in the place of the dead because the resurrection to all flesh hasn't happened yet, okay? Peter is saying, I know that David said this, but David wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Christ. Ready? 30. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw, he prophesied, and spoke, prophesied, about the resurrection of the Christ. This is the first time where Jesus is expressly called the Christ in the book of Acts. That he was not abandoned to Hades, that is the underworld, he was not left to die and stay in the ground, nor did his flesh decay or see corruption. He didn't get all putrid all right, and come out as a skeleton. We saw his body, and it's healthy, and it's well. This Jesus, God the Father, raised up. And then he says, of that we, he points around to his 11 brothers, we are all witnesses. We were there. We saw him. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, that is the place of power and authority, does not mean that Jesus has to stay on, on God the Father's right hand all the time. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus talked about that during his three-year ministry, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, just as Joel said. And then he says, because David didn't go into heavens, but he himself says, and this is one of the most confusing verses in all of scripture for me. I have such a difficult time understanding this, even though I've studied it over and over. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Like, okay, who is the Lord, my Lord? Who is talking here? Is this David? Is this Jesus? Are we talking about, who are we talking about? 
So um, I, when you go into the um, the Greek, the, the word here in both Lord, Lord is kurios. Uh, so that doesn't help. It's not, you know, one is not Lord and the other Adonai, so that we be given a hint. Um, so what is going on? So the Lord, if we understand God the Father, okay, said to my Lord. Now, my Lord is a more personal term. It's, it's not just a Lord, it's my Lord. And who is the God that is mine? Well, it's Jesus. That's how I know the other one and the other two, actually. It's only through Jesus that we see the Father. So if we understand this is the first Lord refers to God the Father, and the second, my Lord, refers to God the Son or Jesus, then we understand that God the Father says to his Son, sit at my right hand, as we, we had up, up here, right, until I make your enemies your footstool, until you conquer all, until you properly rule over everything, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And we're told that in the rest of the scripture, Okay. Um, we're not talking about earthly enemies here. We're talking about sin and death. And so until Christ comes again, he is in the place of power and authority at God the Father's right hand, right? And when the time comes that he is going to finally put death and sin into the abyss forever and ever, and it's no longer going to afflict us, then uh, Christ will descend from the right hand of God and come back to the earth, okay? That, we're getting to Revelations, and I don't want to do that because it's complicated, okay? But uh, just know that God the Father here is speaking to God the Son, and he says, here, this is your rightful place, and you eventually you will come and put all things right for the people, all right? So that's what David prophesied, and that's what Peter is saying is happening right now in the midst of all these people who are hearing the mighty works of God proclaimed in their own language in accordance with the prophecy of Joel. All right. 36, Peter's summing it all up. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, the Messiah, this Jesus of Nazareth, and then he puts it again, whom you crucified, right? Doesn't let him get away. Now, what happens because of this message? Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That is, that they were, they were broken in their sin. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, you're right. We should have caught this. We missed it. What do we do now? How do we get right with God again? How do we get back into the covenant? How do we move forward with this new covenant? How, how do we have this relationship with God again? What do we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Those things go together, repentance and baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So he tells everyone who's gathered there to be baptized. And I'm betting that it's in the passive. Let's go back. Acts 2, what are we at? Uh, 38, Acts 2, 38 in the Greek. I'm betting uh, Peter told them repent Okay, so that's what they do. Um, and then when we get to baptizonto, baptizotheto, sorry. Uh, yep. Imperative passive. That's what it is. To be baptized. It means you have to have it done by somebody else. It's not your own decision. It is something that happens to you. It's interesting that all the things about baptism and salvation and being saved are done to you. You do not do them yourself. They're in the passive voice, meaning that God does them. So accepting the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior does not save you. The faith that allows you to call Jesus Christ as God and Lord, which came through a hearing of the gospel and was a gift of the Holy Spirit, that is what saves you. And that was given to you by God. It was done to you by another, which is why Lutherans don't talk about um, accepting Christ, and you won't hear that, because we believe we don't do that. We believe that God has chosen us, and he has acted upon us. He's always the doer, not us. And that comes from the passive in the Greek, okay? And we'll come back to that because there's another point where the passive comes into play, all right? So, be baptized. So, um, this promise is for you. Oh, wait, sorry. Be baptized, everyone in you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So, forgiveness of sins comes with baptism. It's not just a, an ordinance, it's actually a, a forgiveness. It, it gives you the forgiveness of sins. Now, did you already have that forgiveness of sins through your faith in Christ? Of course. 
Do you receive more forgiveness when pastor says it, your sins are forgiven? Yes. Do you receive more forgiveness when you eat and drink the bread and wine, which is the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. But do you also receive forgiveness of sins when you're baptized? Yes. Okay? So he's just pouring out. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says you'll receive the same thing that we will. Now, will you be able to speak in tongues? Eh, probably not. Will you be able to heal others with your cloak? Eh, probably not. Will you be able to tread on the lion and the cobra? Eh, probably not. Will you be able to have faith in Christ and say that God is Lord because no one can say that Jesus Christ is, is Lord except by the Holy Spirit? Yes, you'll be able to do that, right? Will you be able to believe in Christ your Lord? Yes, because the gift of the Holy Spirit creates faith. Uh, so you'll receive those things that are pertinent to faith, not necessarily the same apostolic gifts. Now, note, not every church believes this. There's a whole group of churches, all right, the Pentecostal church, um, some of the apostolic branches, I believe, that do believe that if you have the Holy Spirit, you will be able to do things. Handle snakes is one of the most uh, explicit examples, all right, but to also speak in tongues, all right, have the gift of prophecy, things like that. Again, I don't believe that because, again, the Bible says those things will cease and pass away. But Peter says, baptism gives you the forgiveness of sins, gives you the Holy Spirit, and it's all a gift, and it's something that has to be done to you. It's not something you do yourself. And then he says, now remember, he said, be baptized every one of you. And then he says, this promise, okay, that you'll receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and also your children. Okay? So this idea that we don't baptize children or infants is ridiculous. It's not biblical. Sorry, Baptists. Whew. I don't know how you get around this. I really don't. You could say, well, he's talking about, you know, the children the age of something, something and, and beyond. Uh, okay, that's some mental gymnastics. For me, this makes total sense. Uh, all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Notice that God is the one who does it and calls them. And Jesus himself says, let the little children come to me. Little children, by the way, little children who believe in me, all of those, okay? Some of the words that are used in the Bible for children believing and having faith can actually refer to children still in the womb. So, yeah. Anyway, that's a different topic for another time. Lutherans baptize babies in accordance with the historical church that goes back to the time of the apostles. So, okay. Um, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, that is, encourage them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Saying the times are bad, save yourself. Now, this is a terrible translation. I'm sorry. This, this save yourselves is terrible because it makes it sound like you have to do it. And it's not how it is, because if you go to Acts 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 40, you'll see the same thing that we saw before. Sothete. The translation is be saved. It's in the passive voice. Someone else has to save you. You can't do it yourself. So why they translate it as save yourselves instead of be saved, you yourselves, from this crooked generation, I don't know. It should be the other way around to iterate that, listen, this is not something you do. It's something that God does to you through the sacrament of baptism, through the preaching of the word, and through life in his church. God serves you. God saves you. If it's up to you, you're going to screw it up. If you let God do it, if God does it all, then it's perfect. Okay? Now, what happens when he does all this? So he tells them, hey, this is something that we should have been prepared for. We should have seen it. Jesus is the Messiah. You yourselves saw it. We crucified him. We saw him raised from the dead. We're all witnesses of that. The Joel told us that this would happen. And this promise is for you and your children. So just repent of, of everything you've done. Be baptized and receive the gifts of faith and forgiveness and life and salvation that come along with this gift. How do they receive it? Verse 41, those who received his word were baptized and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls, 3,000 people converted to Christianity in that moment. Incredible. A gift of the Holy Spirit. There is a harvest of people 
that goes along with the harvest of wheat and the harvest of grapes that were traditionally being celebrated by God's people. And God throws the doors wide open to people from every tribe, nation, and language and invites them in for the feast. That is not meaning that everybody should come up for communion. We'll talk about that some other time. But what it means is, is that Jesus died for the whole world and that God is gathering in his people who are baptized and who believe, all right, regardless of where they come from. When we get to Paul, we'll see that even more explicitly spread out to pagans and Jews and uh, uh, Gentiles and people who did not have the faith of Abraham or the direct bloodline to Abraham. Of course, we all do because we go back to Adam and Eve, but you get me, all right? But right here, we're seeing this, this beginning of the remember point of that Jesus is for Gentiles too, all right? But what we see is God gathering in his people from everywhere, a harvest of souls to go along with the feast of the harvest that was happening in Jerusalem. And what did they do? They, that is all of these people, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they were doing Bible study. They were listening to what they had, had seen and done, to the fellowship of being there for each other, to the breaking of bread, probably a reference to communion, okay, and to prayers. And we see, and we have records of, of these sorts of things going on the second century at least. So we know that in house churches and in meeting plans, that's that's what they did. They, they listened to the apostles, and later they would read their letters, um, and they would pray, and they would celebrate communion. Uh, verse 43, and what happened in their doing this? Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Does that mean that your pastor should be able to do many wonders and signs like the apostles did? No, because again, Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive. We can't all guarantee that we have apostolic gifts. And the Bible says that they'll cease, and so maybe they have. I think they have. Because I think we everything God does, he accomplishes through the word and his sacraments. We don't need anything beyond the proclamation of the gospel, the administration of baptism, and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That's all we need from here to the time when Christ comes again in glory. So I don't need another prophecy because I have the Bible. I don't need an apostolic gift to heal somebody's cancer because I can give them the medicine of immortality in the Lord's Supper. So the things that attended the apostles' preaching and teaching in the first century were there to verify that this was different and that this was indeed correct. And as a tangible proof, the disciples, the apostles, were able to do miraculous things like their teacher did. And that's how you see, very quickly, also the message going out fast and a lot of people coming to faith. And we see that at Pentecost. Miraculous gift of speaking in tongues produces a harvest of 3,000 people right away. We can't expect that to happen today. Maybe it can, maybe it will, but we can't, shouldn't expect it when the Bible says that these sorts of things will cease. And instead, we go back to what we know, which is make disciples by baptizing and teaching them and doing the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him handing out his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Christ has told us to do. He hasn't told me to go out and speak in tongues on the street corner. All right? So, let's finish it out. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. So they moved from a life of, of hoarding their own goods into saying, we're all together in this. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They were caring for each other. All right? They realized that life was more than just trying to get ahead and, and look out for you and yours, that they had a generosity that the world around them did not have, all right? And that's something that is supposed to still um, distinguish Christians from the world around them, all right? And so we still do works of charity. Charity work is a mark of the true church. It is, okay? Okay. Um, now, do we all need to sell everything we have and give it all to the church? Rome proclaimed that at one time, right? Um, but uh, we take an offering. It's a portion, a portion to represent the whole. And uh, through that, we, we do care for people. We have a charitable account here that mostly goes to care for our own members, but also from people that just uh, need a little extra help that may not be a part of our church. <coughs> we try to care for all of God's people because, again... We all go back to Adam and Eve. And what happened through this charity? Verse 46, 
day by day, attending the temple together. So they still went to the temple. Now, are they participating in the sacrifices and everything else? I don't know. I imagine that some of them still were. And I think at that time, it was sort of like, okay, you have a greater understanding. It's okay to, to still do these old things because we haven't fleshed this out yet. We'll still see the people, the Hebrew people, insisting on uh, new converts being circumcised, even if they're not Hebrews by birth. Um, and then later in the New Testament, you know, Paul, again, says, like, no, that's not what this, this is. Baptism is the mark of the covenant now. And um, so circumcision is neither here nor there. Uh, you'll still see people insisting on keeping the old dietary requirements. And Paul will say, well, no, that's, that's not exactly what God wants. And Peter was actually told in a vision that he could eat whatever he wanted. Um, and so God has to correct that. So this is still that sort of burgeoning, transitioning period where not everything is all figured out yet because it's all very new. And so when they went to temple, did some of them probably go and do the same things that they had always done as Jews? Sure. But now they have a greater understanding that all of it pointed ahead to Christ. And I think through the apostles' teaching, they all are seeing that all of this was leading up into Christ, and it was still Christ that they were worshiping. I do believe that. Now, do Jews today worship Christ? I don't think so. Um, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, all right, are they having communion in their home? Probably, yes. Uh, it's under the, the, gui the guidance of the, the apostles, absolutely, I think. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. How were they saved? By calling on Jesus, because remember what Joel said up here? It shall come to pass that everyone, everyone, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that calling upon the name of the Lord wasn't just saying, hey, Jesus, save me. You have to go and understand everything that Jesus was about, and that's why there's teaching going on. That's why they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, all right? It's not enough just to sit in church anymore, and still today. You have to be devoted to the teaching, to just say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, what does your Jesus mean, and what does your Jesus do? right? So there has to be some content to that faith, and you're only going to get that through study, through study with people who know more than you, through study with people that God has trained and called to serve the church in that capacity. We're not apostles these days, but we're generally called pastors or priests or ministers or, or whatever your tradition has, okay? Get in there, Bible study, ask them, that sort of thing, all right? So what do we see in um, the second chapter of Acts? We see that God is throwing open the doors to people of all places and all languages, and he'll throw it open even more later when we get to actually bringing in the Gentiles explicitly into the covenant. Jesus died for the sins of all people. That's what we're seeing revealed here in the book of Acts. There's a harvest of souls that attends the ways and the means by which God calls and gathers his people, first and foremost through the preaching of the mighty works of God in Jesus Christ. So the proclamation of Jesus Christ, preaching, and the reading of the gospel are the ways in which the church grows. We don't want to believe that. We want to think it's through marketing, through going door to door or whatever else. But really, honestly, the Bible says that it's the preaching of the word and the gathering of God's people together in the church that actually grows the church. So get here, listen, and come. That's, that's the first thing you need to do. You want your church to grow? You have to go every week. Remember the Sabbath day rolls around every week. It's a commandment, not a suggestion. Every member of your church should be in church every Sunday or every Saturday, however you do that. But that's just a commandment. There's no way around that. Sorry. Um, and if we had that, the churches wouldn't have any problems today. They really wouldn't. Even if people were only giving a fraction, a 1% of their, their offering, if you had all your, your members who are on your roll show up every week, that would be enough. But it's not. So if you want to talk about evangelism, let's start close to home. Let's start with your own attendance every week. And then let's start with your family's attendance every week. Let's start with those friends of yours who belong to the church that you haven't seen in a while but you still see on uh, golf every Saturday or at the bar every Thursday or whatever it is and say, hey, haven't seen you in church in a while. Why don't you come with me this, uh, this Saturday, this Sunday, right? 
let's start there before we start talking about how we need to go door to door. So evangelism happens through the preaching and proclamation of God's word and also people actually showing up to church who are supposed to be there. It's straightforward. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Deal with it because it's right here. All right. We see that the preaching of God's word produced a harvest of 3,000 souls and then those people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the ministry of the church, sold everything they have, took care of each other. It's right here in Acts 2. All right. Um, and then finally, as we looked at those sorts of things, those requirements, uh, be baptized, be saved. Those are passive. They're not something you choose and do yourself. They are something that is wrought and begun in you by God himself. So the only way that you can say, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior is because the Holy Spirit has already worked on your heart and allowed you to say that Jesus is Lord and personal Savior because Jesus has already chosen you before you ever chose Jesus. So that's why Lutherans don't talk about accepting Jesus into our heart because God has already accepted us in Jesus Christ. I hope you got something interesting out of our study today. Again, uh, there's a lot here. Uh, I hope uh, that you're picking up on, on something that uh, helps you grow and helps you think about uh, this time. It's an amazing time to remember this. This was a historical event. This didn't just happen on paper. This was really something that happened in our history around 30 AD. Um, it's just incredible to think about it that way. So hope that's interesting to you. I will see you next week, God willing, for our third chapter of the book of Acts. Thank you and take care.